Yes, women workers do present problems, Joe. Women scare me. At least, they do in a factory. Well, maybe the women are scared too, Joe. If you want to see just how changing conceptions of gender challenge the very heart of our society, we can do no better than to look at the issue of sexual harassment. It'll tell us something of how difficult it has been for women to achieve even a semblance of equality in the workplace. We know, after all this time, that the workplace, even though women long ago entered it, was always imagined as a male domain. At work, men demonstrated their masculinity through skill, and there they revealed their ability to support and sustain families. The workplace was their turf. Men adopted strategies of hostility and exclusion against unwanted competitors. In the course of industrialization, Privileged white workers, as well as their employers, marginalized outsiders, the formerly enslaved, immigrants, people of color, and females. All those who might challenge the relatively privileged places of white working class males found themselves crowded into the poorest paying and most difficult jobs. Women are among the longest lasting of the excluded. To be clear, sex was always the weapon of choice against women. To ensure that women remained in their places, laboring men as well as employers and supervisors deployed sexual innuendo, demanded sexual quid pro quos, and intimidated women with aggressive sexual commentary about looks, dress, and body language. From the early 19th century, working men complained that women who earned were like millstones around their necks, and women feared the need to earn wages precisely because, outside of family protection, they risk losing their virtue to predatory males. I'm sorry, Mr. O'Neill, but I don't go out with customers. Oh, well, I'm not a customer. I'm a, an associate. You heard what your boss said. I'm priority. One way to think about the much-praised boarding house system in the 19th century Lowell, Massachusetts textile mills is to understand that the new corporations had to surround women with protection for their sexual virtue in order to get them to work at all. Excluded from most skilled trades and crowded into just a few occupations, women found their wages reduced to bare minimums and their survival in peril. The situation was infinitely worse for the poorest women. Needing to support families or lacking families to fall back on many women remained silent in the face of sexual coercion. Some succumbed to invitations to provide sexual favors in order to keep their jobs or to tide them over during periods of unemployment. Such was the danger to women that late 19th century moral reformers attributed most prostitution to women's failure to find good places in the workforce and many assumed that women sacrificed their respectability merely by going out to work. Why cannot a woman be considered virtuous if she does mingle with the toilers? Asked a 19th century seamstress, desperate merely to make a living. Working men benefited from this behavior because it successfully limited competition for their jobs. The threat of female labor kept working class men from apprenticing or training women. Sexual harassment convinced women who might otherwise have been tempted by good jobs to stay out of them. Employers benefited as well. 
They brandished the possibility of hiring women to replace men to keep wages low for both men and women. They exploited gender divisions exactly the way they exploited ethnic and racial divisions to inhibit solidarity, unionization, and collective action among workers. The 1970s court cases that changed this emerged from the ranks of the labor force. Diane Williams, an African-American employee of the U.S. Justice Department, sued to get her job back after she was fired in 1972 because she refused to sleep with her boss. Her victory set a precedent for barring demands for quid pro quo sexual favors. In 1975, Paulette Barnes, also African-American and also an employee of the federal government, found that her job had been eliminated when she refused her boss's request for sex. When she complained, the courts first denied that she had been discriminated against on the grounds of gender, but rather because her refusal to acquiesce demonstrated an inharmonious personal relationship that does not evidence an arbitrary barrier to continued employment based on appellant sex. I'm quoting there. A federal court reversed the decision, calling the demand for such favors a discrimination based on sex. More cases followed, until by the early 1980s, the point had been made, legally, sexual harassment then constituted a form of discrimination that limited women's opportunities and restricted their options in the workplace. But legal decisions didn't change the culture. It took demographic and technological change to remove the blinders. By the early 1990s, notice how recent this is, Women constituted almost half the workforce, and they wanted to share in the rewards of good jobs. But sexual coercion in the workforce remained endemic, deeply embedded in gendered relationships and firmly reinforced by normative assumptions about female nature, male breadwinning, and women's commitments to the home that had long shaped the workplace. No better example of the public failure to come to terms with changing gender norms exists than the image of a dignified Anita Hill facing a panel of white male senators in 1991. Professor, do you swear to tell the whole truth and nothing but the truth to help you God? I do. Thank you. He talked about pornographic materials depicting individuals with large penises or large breasts involved in various sex acts. On several occasions, Thomas told me graphically of his own sexual prowess. Because I was extremely uncomfortable talking about sex with him at all, and particularly in such a graphic way, I told him that I did not want to talk about these subjects. You testified this morning that the most embarrassing question involved, this is not too bad, women's large breasts. That's a word we use all the time. Senators from both political parties harassed Hill for daring to name the crude behavior of her former boss, who would soon become a Supreme Court justice. In 2016, these issues exploded, perhaps because women fully understood by then that wage earning would be a lifetime commitment, or perhaps because a few brave and well-known celebrities denounced the use of the casting couch to influence women's opportunities to work in the film industry, or because Hollywood mogul Harvey Weinstein so egregiously illuminated coercive male behavior, and not least, because presidential candidate Donald Trump revealed his own expectations of unlimited access to female favors. 
The public saw the tension first in a Time's Up movement that involved mainly celebrity artists. But quickly, other women began to say, Me Too. A Me Too movement exposed the deep roots of sexual coercion throughout the working environment. At first, important women spoke out, and then working women from every walk of life, office workers, hotel cleaners, health care aides, and academics whose voices had long been ignored, began to be heard. The chorus of protest swelled until it engendered public protest that bridged racial and generational as well as gender divides. In the wake of a Me Too movement, Supreme Court nominee Brett Kavanaugh faced accusations of sexual abuse leveled by a credible scientist. I was pushed onto the bed and Brett got on top of me. He began running his hands over my body and grinding into me. I yelled, hoping that someone downstairs might hear me. When I did, Brett put his hand over my mouth to stop me from yelling. This is what terrified me the most and has had the most lasting impact on my life. Though in this instance, the abuse hadn't occurred at work, the incident revealed just how much the public feared that arrogant male sexual behavior might influence a justice's job performance.